you'll take your copy of the Scriptures, please, and turn with me to Luke chapter 22. I'm going to be reading from verse 14. We're actually going to be looking at several passages of Scripture this morning, but this is Luke's account of the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper. If you'd like to stand as I begin reading at verse 14 of Luke 22. Luke wrote, And when the hour came, he, that is Jesus, reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat uh, it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Behold, the hand of him who betrays me uh, is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Pray with me again. Father, thank you for your grace to us. Thank you for the privilege that we have to gather together freely to remember Jesus Christ. To think about what he has done. To think about the symbols that we have before us today of the broken body and the shed blood. Father, help me to speak with clarity. Help those who are here to understand. Thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit to teach us and to clarify things for us. Father, we ask that you would be glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. I call this message, uh, Word, Water, Cup. And bread. I based it on um, a book I read a long time ago um, that was written by a Methodist, uh, actually Will Williman. Some of you may know of him. At one time he was uh, the Bishop of North Alabama, but at the time he wrote the book and that I was reading the book, he was the Dean of the Chapel at Duke University. And the title of his book was Word, Water, Wine, and Bread. And I thought, wine's not going to go over in a Baptist church. So we call it word, water, cup, and bread, and it says the same thing. The, these three things, the word, the water, the cup, and the bread are, are symbolic elements in our spiritual life. And that's what we're going to talk about briefly this morning as, as we look at this. The, the three basic elements. First, the word. Matthew 28, 19, uh, or 18 and following says this, All authority... In heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We're given the command there to go, make disciples, and to baptize. The Apostle Paul, when writing to Timothy near the end of, of, of Paul's life, he was in prison. He wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 4.2. He said, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. The word of God is central in the church, in a Baptist church in particular. One of the reasons that our pulpit is in the middle is not so everybody has an equal chance of seeing the preacher but because the Word of God is central. In other church traditions, they have what's called a divided chancel. And they'll have a place where you preach the Word on one side and a place where you read and make announcements and lead music on the other side. And in the middle, the, they focus on uh, the Lord's table or the Eucharist. 
But in Baptist churches, we put the pulpit in the middle because the Word of God is central. We've been told to preach the Word. It is the Word that is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and bone and marrow, and is the discerner of the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. It is the Word of God that is profitable to us for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. We center our lives on what the Word of God teaches us. We're told to make disciples through the preaching, the proclamation of the Word of God. And this Word of God is what informs us and helps us to form our understanding of who God is, of what sin is, of what salvation is, what sanctification is, and what glorification is. All those things are important. Those are long words, but they're basically telling us that we have a holy and righteous God who created us, but that human beings rebelled against Him in sin, and that He did something to bring us back to Himself, to reconcile us to Himself, and He sent His Son who took our sin upon Him on His shoulders, shed His blood for us, and that those who place faith and trust in Him will have everlasting life. That's what the Word of God is about. That's a, a succinct expression of that. The Word of God is powerful. We need to focus our attention on the Word. Baptists have always claimed to be a people of the book. Sometimes we don't live up to our claims. And sometimes we want to add to the word or uh, we bring some traditions in. But our desire is to have the word of God central in everything that we do. And because the word of God is central, we want to baptize. We're told, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe whatsoever I have commanded you. There in Matthew 28, we're told we are to baptize. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, we see the first public act of the disciples after the Holy Spirit came and it said, So those who received his word were baptized, and that day uh, were added, that day about 3,000 souls. Baptism is important. Baptism is a picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that's what we picture when we baptize folks now. We picture them dying to their old life and being resurrected into new life. As we read through the New Testament, we see that Jesus Christ authorized baptism. One, he commanded it. We'll get to that in just a moment. But there are three things that show that Jesus wanted baptism to take place. One, there is Christ's example for baptism. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17, the scriptures read this way. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, that's John, consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Now, we could uh, stop there and go off in many different directions talking about the deity of Jesus Christ and uh, we could talk about uh, the, the Trinity because they're all present here, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We could talk about how the Son pleases the Father and that the Father is well pleased with Him, but our emphasis this morning is simply on the elements that are important in the worship of the church 
And the word of God is central, and then baptism is central because Christ has set that example. He set the example by himself submitting to baptism. And then we also have Christ's concurrence in baptism. He concurred. He went along with baptism. He did not stop it from taking place. John chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, here we see the reputation that Jesus is concurring with the baptisms that was taking place, and he was having more effect than John. John was having baptisms. He was uh, baptizing people. They were participating in a baptism of repentance. And Jesus went along with disciples being baptized and following him. That's one of the reasons we talk about baptism. By the way, uh, in just a little bit, we will partake of the elements of the Lord's Supper and our church, and I'll probably say this again later, would invite you to partake in that. Uh, there, there are three attitudes toward um, communion. There is what's called um, open communion, which is the invitation for anybody who wants to, uh, to take part. And then there is what's called closed communion, which says you can only take part if you are a member of this church. And that's not the attitude of this church. And then there's what's called close communion. And that's my understanding is what this church practices. It's what my attitude is. And, and what we say is if you are a baptized believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are a member in good standing of the church of which you are a part, then we invite you to participate in the Lord's table. Baptism in our understanding, is a requirement for participation in the Lord's table. And of course, there's a requirement for baptism in that you be a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you've acknowledged your sin and that you put your trust and your hope in him. So for baptism, there's Christ's example, there's Christ's concern, and then there's Christ's command. Jesus said, Matthew 28, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them. That's another application of the word. Go, make disciples, and baptize. That's, that's two of the elements. The word of God and then baptism. And then the Lord's table or communion as uh, Jameson referred to it other, it's also uh, earlier, it's also called the Eucharist, um, the Lord's Table, the Lord's Supper. And we read, uh, as we begin, um, Luke chapter 22, look at verse 17, and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom comes. And he took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup uh, after they had eaten saying, This cup is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. As baptism symbolizes the beginning of our Christian life, of our walk of faith, the Lord's Supper, among other things, is symbolic of our continuing fellowship and dependence on the Lord. One is entering into the fellowship and declaring to the world, I am a new person, and participating in the Lord's Supper, saying, I am continuing in fellowship with the Lord. I am depending on Him. We are commanded by the Lord to do this in remembrance of him. Do this in remembrance of him. We're to think about him. I was listening to a podcast this week. Mark Clifton is a uh, church revitalization specialist, and he was talking about, he says, one of the things that we fail to do as Baptists is we fail to celebrate the Lord. That, that we... We need to acknowledge that he is here with us. 
And when we come together, we don't need to pray that he will be here. We need to pray that we will recognize his presence already among us. He is here. We are to remember him. We are to think about him. He's represented physically in the, the juice and the bread that we will have here. But he is here with us. He dwells in us. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. He is here in this place. And we need to remember him. There, are, there was a guy on the podcast who was talking about the fact there are Southern Baptist Church that practice communion weekly. And he says the reason we do that is we want our folks to remember Jesus, to focus, focus attention on him. We're to remember that he is here. We're commanded to do this. Why are we to do this? One, it reminds us of his presence. You know, he promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. He said, I will be with you always. And when we have these elements with us, it's reminding us that he is with us. It reminds us of the new covenant that he established with his blood in our hearts. He prophesied in Jeremiah that there would be a new covenant. He promised that those of us who were not of Abraham, who were aliens in the world, are made a part and we are grafted in to Abraham. We have come in to the covenant and we are joint heirs with Christ. We're reminded of this new covenant. It reminds us of his sacrificial love, his broken body, and his shed blood. Reminds us of what Romans 5, 8 says. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Lord's Supper also reminds us of the judgment to come and provides opportunity for self-examination and confession. The whole reason for the act that instituted the Lord's Supper, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, is that judgment has come into the world, and those who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ are condemned already, John 3, was it 17 or 18, says. And judgment is coming, and God will hold us accountable, and we need to prepare for that judgment. And then, as believers, it gives us the opportunity to have fellowship restored for us, to examine our hearts, to see where we have taken a turn in the wrong direction, and to acknowledge that to the Lord, and apply 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us, actually to keep on cleansing us, from all unrighteousness. Reminds us that judgment is coming and we will be held accountable. And then it also reminds us that he is coming back. He's coming back. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Most communion tables that you find in the church on the front say, in remembrance of me. But I've seen at least one communion table that instead of in remembrance of me, it says, till he comes. In remembrance is looking back. Till he comes is looking ahead. Jesus is coming back. That is our blessed hope. Our blessed hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm, these are not in my notes, but just look, look to Titus chapter 2, just a moment. Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions 
and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. We are to look for Christ's return and we're to proclaim that. And that's what the Lord's table reminds us of. We may forget about it. We get so caught up in the drudgery of the day by day and the things that we have to do. But we have a Savior who is coming back for his own. And we need to celebrate that. We have three elements that are central in our faith. The word, the water, and the cup and the bread. These point us to our fellowship and our dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Baptist confession of faith, or at least one of our Baptist confessions of faith, says this. The Lord's Supper is meant to promote spiritual nourishment and growth in Christ and to strengthen the ties that bind them, that is believers, to all the duties they owe him. The Lord's Supper is also a bond and a pledge of the fellowship which believers have with Christ and with one another. This is an important thing that we do this morning. We come to faith in Christ through the proclamation of the word and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. We commit ourselves to him and declare ourselves a follower. Our public profession of faith is baptism in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we declare our continuing fellowship with him as we participate in the elements of the Lord's table. May God give us grace to enter into this with a holy attitude, with a desire to worship the Lord and to fellowship with him because of what he has done on our behalf. So let's take this opportunity now to examine our hearts, to look within. First, do I even have a relationship with the Lord? Have I come to saving faith? Has the Lord done a work in him? Do I need to trust him today as Savior? And then secondly, am I in fellowship with him? Have I acknowledged to him my sin of this day? My bad attitude, my broken relationships, those things that can separate me from Christ. You know, Isaiah, was it 66, 18, says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. I think one translation says, if I cherish iniquity in my heart, if there's a pet sin that I kind of like to protect and and kind of hold back from the Lord. If I've got that, that in my heart, then my prayers are hindered. I can't really fellowship with the Lord. I need to confess that and come to him. Maybe you're here and you've professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but you've not been baptized. You haven't declared your faith publicly through being baptized and telling the world that you have died to the world and that you've been buried with Christ in baptism and now that you've been raised to walk in newness of life. The Lord calls us to live in fellowship with him. And this table that we partake of is the expression of that fellowship. So let's just take a moment quietly now and bow our heads where you are and look within. And if you need to make things right with the Lord, do that now. Confess your sin. Thank him for his grace. Thank him that he provides for us everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of who he is.
you're here and you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, we, we would invite you to put your trust and your hope in him now. And, and if you'd like to stand and come down, I will be glad to open the word with you and show you how you can put faith and trust in him. Father, thank you that we can come to you from where we are and for whatever reason we have need. And through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are given access to you. That blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness, and we thank you for that. Thank you that you hear the prayer of your children. We pray, Father, that you would bless us now with a sense of your presence, a sense of fellowship with you and with one another as we partake of the elements of this Lord's table. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.